Hey y'all, Emery here, and today I want to read you my first tale worth telling. It's a short story entitled Gramps Gifts. Are we there yet? Sarah asked her mom for what seemed like the hundredth time. We're getting close, honey. I promise I'll tell you when we're almost there, her mother responded. I'm going to see them first this year, Sarah declared. It was one of their many Christmas traditions. Every year, the Anderson family visited Grandma and Grandpa Anderson up in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Georgia. And every year, Ed and his sister Sarah tried to be the first to see them standing on their porch when they arrived. Ed had been at the game longer than Sarah since he was a few years older, and he remembered to look for them at the front door instead of the side door by where they parked. Graham and Gramp, as Ed and Sarah called them, were always standing on the porch at the front door when they got there for Christmas. Christmas was one of Ed's favorite words. In the word Christmas, he found excitement, anticipation, joy, and a subtle kind of warmth he couldn't quite describe. It was his favorite day of the year, and it was almost here. He'd been out of school for nearly a week, and the anticipation of a trip to his grandparents had been building. In his mind, Christmas smelled like his grandmother's kitchen, like warm bread, hot chocolate, pecan pie, and sugar cookies. I see them, Sarah exclaimed. Ed looked up from his comic book, afraid he'd lost the game, but realized his sister was looking at the wrong house and the wrong grandparents. That's not them. Their house is brown, and it's on the other side of the road, Ed replied, relieved that he still had the chance to win. Well, we'll be there in a minute. It's just around the next curve, Dad told Sarah from the driver's seat. There were a lot of curves on the way to Graham and Gramps' house. Ed had always loved the mountains and looked forward to their annual chip trip to Blairsville almost as much for the chance to run and play in the hills behind the house as for all the good things he knew were waiting inside. Graham always had a pie or two fresh out of the oven. The tree was always brightly decorated, and there were always lots of presents under it. But his favorite part of the trip was the time he spent with Gramp in his study, listening to him read stories. Okay, get ready, we're almost there, Mom said. Ed and Sarah both looked out the passenger side window as they rounded one last wooded corner. Suddenly, they saw the red, white, and blue mailbox, the signal that they were there. Where are they? I don't see them, Sarah said. I do. Graham's wearing her apron, and Gramps got on his red shirt, Ed declared triumphantly. Where? asked Sarah, disappointed. At the front door, Ed pointed as he said it. The front door? Oh, yeah, I forgot. They stand at that door when we come, Sarah said. Ha, maybe next time, sis, Ed said. I'll remember next time, Sarah replied. Once they had hugged Graham and Gramp, unloaded their luggage and presents from the car, and waited impatiently while Dad and Gramp talked about the traffic in Atlanta and seemingly every other subject under the sun. Gramp looked over at Ed and Sarah and asked what they wanted to do. Ed knew Gramp was only teasing him because there was only one thing he wanted to do, and Gramp knew it. Ed jumped up and ran down the hall to the last door on the left, where he knew Gramp's study was. Sarah followed, calling to Ed. Hey, where are you going? She asked. Dad replied, Ed's going to Gramp's study. You remember where the study is, don't you? Oh yeah, that's where Gramp keeps all that cool stuff and reads us those stories, Sarah said. That's right. I bet he's got a great one planned for you this time. Go with Ed. Gramp's on his way, Dad said. Hey, Gramp, is it okay if I get a fire going? It's a little cold in here, Dad asked as Gramp headed down the hall. Sure, there are matches on the mantel, Gramp replied. As Ed opened the door to Gramp's study, he could smell the rich leather of his desk chair, the old oak of his bookshelves, and the slightly musty smell of his books. So many books. Ed had never seen as many books at one place except in a bookstore or a library. Gramp loved books. He had books about history and war and books about people and places, he had more books about the Bible than any other kind, but the ones that Ed liked the most were the story books, as he called them. Gramp called them fiction. Ed wasn't sure what that meant, but he knew that when he was sitting in one of the leather chairs in Gramp's study, listening to him read, 
he could almost see the story being played out in his mind. Grant was a great reader. He didn't just read the words. He read them the way the character would have said them, or in a way that you could imagine the action happening. You could feel the rough oak of a tree or smell flowers. You could hear the creak of a barn door or whatever was in the story. Ed could almost feel the cold when he listened to him read about a boy lost in a snowstorm or a warm breeze when he read about tropical islands. And he could almost hear the long, lonesome call of the whippoorwill in stories about the woods at night. Of all the stories that Grant read him, Ed liked adventure stories the best. He would close his eyes and imagine that he was the character in the story. In his imagination, he had been around the world, from the Rocky Mountains to the jungles of South America, to the shores of Scotland and the foggy streets of London. As he entered the small, cozy room and turned on the light, he walked to his favorite chair and sat down, wondering what adventures Grant would read about today. Grant came in and walked to his chair behind the big oak desk in the middle of the room. Then Sarah followed and climbed up in another big leather chair next to Ed. Well, what story are you going to read to us today, Grant? Sarah asked. Well, I've thought long and hard about which story we ought to read this time, and I've settled on one that I think you'll both like, said Grant. Well, what's it about? asked Sarah. Oh, it's about adventure, and mystery, and danger, Grant replied. It sounds scary, Sarah said. It sounds great, Ed countered. <laughs> well, I promise it won't be too scary, but I think you'll both like it. Oh, what's it called? Ed asked. It's called The Call of the Wild by Jack London. I think we're supposed to read that in school next semester, Ed said. Well, you'll have a head start on everyone else, Grant replied. How does it start? asked Sarah. Grant cleared his throat and began reading. <clears throat> Buck did not read the newspapers, or he would have known that trouble was brewing, not alone for himself, but for every Tidewater dog, strong of muscle and with warm, long hair from Puget Sound to San Diego. As Grant read, Ed closed his eyes and imagined that he was with Buck, the big St. Bernard dog who was the hero of the story. Grant read about Buck being taken from his home in California and ending up as a sled dog in Alaska. The story was filled with adventure, danger, and mystery, just as Grant said it would be. Ed opened his eyes and looked over at Sarah. She was staring at Grant in rapt attention. Buck stood and looked on, the successful champion, the dominant primordial beast who had made his first kill and found it good. Grant folded down the corner of the page he had just read and closed the book, looking up at Ed and Sarah. Uh, that's enough for today. We'll pick up where we left off tomorrow, he said. You sure know how to pick great stories, Grant, Ed said. <laughs> this is a book I read when I was about your age, and I've read it many times since. I knew you would like it, replied Grant. Now, what did you think about it, Sarah? Grant asked. I liked it a lot. But I'm afraid for Buck. Is he going to be okay? Sarah asked. <laughs> we'll have to see what happens tomorrow. Now, I have something special for each of you, Gramp announced. You do? Like a present? Ed asked. Yes, I have a Christmas present for each of you, replied Gramp. Already? But Christmas isn't for a couple of days, Sarah exclaimed. I know, but I asked your mom and dad, and they said it would be okay to go ahead and give you a present early, explained Gramp. All right, well, what is it? asked Ed. Grant rolled his chair back from the desk and opened the long drawer in the middle. From the drawer, he produced two packages, each about the size of a small paperback book he'd been reading. One was wrapped in red paper, which he handed across the desk to Sarah, and the other in green, which he gave to Ed. Can we open them now? Ed asked. Sure, go ahead, Grant replied. Ed and Sarah tore the paper off their gifts. It's a book, Sarah replied. It's a Bible, Ed replied. Both, are bi both of the Bibles were about five inches long and three inches wide. They had leather covers. Ed's was gray and Sarah's was pink, and they both had a piece of leather that folded over the cover and snapped to keep them closed. It's great, Grant, but we already have Bibles, Ed said. I know you do. But these are for you to take when you go traveling or running around in the woods or camping, Gramps said. 
I can take mine to my playhouse in our backyard, Sarah explained. But why would I take a Bible camping, Ed asked. Well, I find that when I'm out in creation, I think more about my creator. And I often like to stop and read his word. I've had a small Bible that I've taken with me for years when I go hunting or fishing or camping. Some of the best things I've learned from God's word have been out of my back pocket Bible, Gramps said. Is that what it's called? Sarah asked. Well, that's what I call mine anyway. Uh, you never know when you might find yourself in an adventure and need a guidebook to tell you what to do, Gramps said. An adventure? Ed asked. Sure. Adventure happens all the time. In fact, I've got a little adventure planned for you too, Gramps said. Really? What kind of adventure? Ed asked. Well, before you begin, you'll need one more present, Gramps said. Another present? Sarah asked. Yep, one for each of you, Gramp replied. He reached back in the long drawer and took out two more presents. One wrapped in red he gave to Sarah, and one in green he gave to Ed. Sarah's was bigger than Ed's, but neither noticed much about the others as they tore open the gifts. Both were in boxes, and when Sarah opened hers, she found a beautiful mirror. It had a long, cream-colored handle, and the glass was framed with gold vines. It's beautiful, Gramp. Thank you, Sarah explained. Oh, you're welcome, Grant replied. Ed had opened his box already, and what he found inside was the coolest thing he thought he'd ever seen. It's a pocket knife, Ed exclaimed. Not just a pocket knife, it's a scout knife. It has a blade, a can opener, a screwdriver, a saw, and a leather punch, Grant explained. Wow, it's great, Grant. Thank you so much, Ed said. You're welcome. Now, I want both of you to open your Bibles, Gramp said. Sarah, I want you to open up to Proverbs 31, verse 30. Can you find that? Gramp asked. I think so, Sarah replied. Okay, Ed, you look up Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10, Gramp said. I found it, Sarah exclaimed. Good. Can you read it? Gramp asked. Sure. Favor is dis... dis deceitful, Grant corrected. Oh yeah, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Sarah looked up at Gramp as if to ask if she'd read it right. That's right. Good job. What about yours, Ed? Gramp asked. Ecclesiastes 10.10. 10. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength but wisdom is profitable to direct. What does that mean? Ed asked. Well, that's what your adventure is going to be about. Ed, I want you to ask your dad to go with you into the backyard and find a stick on the ground. Then I want you to take your knife and whittle that stick until you have a sharp point on it, Gramp said. Okay, I can do that, Ed declared. What do you want me to do? Sarah asked. I want you to take your mirror and show it to your mom. Then I want you to ask her to hold it for you while you look in it to brush your hair, Gramps said. Okay, I'll go get her now, Sarah said. Ed and Sarah ran out of Gramps' study and down the hall back to the living room where Dad was sitting next to the fireplace reading a newspaper. He'd gotten a roaring fire going while they had been in Gramps' study. He looked up from his paper as Ed and Sarah came in. Dad, look at my mirror Gramps gave me and my Bible, Sarah said. I see. That's a nice Bible and a beautiful mirror, Dad replied. Thank you. Where's Mom? Sarah asked. Uh, she's in the kitchen with Graham. They're making supper, Dad said. As Sarah ran to the kitchen, Ed held up his knife for his dad to see. Look what Graham gave me, he said. Wow, that's a nice one, Dad said. It's a scout knife. It has a blade and a can opener and a saw and a screwdriver and a leather punch. Uh, Grant said, I'm supposed to ask you to go with me to the backyard and find a stick to whittle a sharp end on, Ed exclaimed. Oh, well, I guess we better get going. Did he give you anything else, Dad asked. Oh, yeah, he gave me a Bible, too, Ed replied as he pulled it from his back pocket. He called it his back pocket Bible, Ed said. Well, yours is nice, too. Uh, let's go find that stick. Grab your coat. It's cold outside, Dad said, as he and Ed both put on their jackets. Ed laid his Bible on the coffee table and followed his dad outside. 
As Ed and his dad were going out the back door into the yard, Sarah was showing her mirror to her mom and Graham. It's beautiful, honey, mom said. Graham said to ask you to hold it for me while I brush my hair, Sarah exclaimed. Oh, okay, here you go, mom said. As Sarah's mom held the mirror up for her to see, Graham handed Sarah a brush she always carried in her apron. Grant teased Graham about it, saying she was always ready to fix her hair in case someone from church dropped in. As Sarah looked into the mirror, she noticed that her face seemed different, distorted somehow. Mom, can you hold it back a little? Sarah asked. Mom moved the mirror further back from Sarah. How's that? she asked. Um, I don't know. It still looks funny, Sarah replied. Well, what do you mean? Mom asked. Well, it looks like my face is bigger than it's supposed to be, Sarah exclaimed. Really? Let me see, Mom said. Sarah's mom turned the mirror around and looked at herself in it. When she did, Sarah saw that there was another mirror on the back, and there was a little yellow piece of paper stuck to the glass. Hey, what's that? Sarah asked. What's what? Mom asked. There's a note on the back, Sarah said. Sarah reached up and peeled the note off the glass. It has another Bible verse on it, Sarah said. Another one? Mom asked. Uh, Gramp had me and Ed read Bible verses when he gave us our presents. The one he had me read was Proverbs 30, verse 31, Sarah explained. Oh, I know that one. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised, Mom quoted. That's it. This one is James 1, 22 through 25. I better look it up and see what it says, Sarah said. Uh, here it is. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed." Why do you think he wanted me to read that? Sarah asked. I think I know, Graham said. The first verse he had you read reminds us that beauty is something that is here today and gone tomorrow. If you think that all that matters is how you look, you have a distorted view of yourself, just like looking in the mirror that made your face look big. The second passage says that the Bible is like a mirror, but it doesn't distort things. It shows us what we're really like, and if we will not ignore what the Bible tells us about ourselves, but fix the things we find that are wrong, then God will bless us, Graham explained. Oh, I see. It's like a riddle. Grant gave me the mirror and the Bible and had me read those verses so I would see that the Bible can help me see when I'm doing right and when I'm doing wrong and how to get it right, Sarah said. I think you got it, sweetie, Mom said. I wonder what riddle Ed is having to figure out, Sarah said. Meanwhile, outside, Ed and his dad had looked all over the backyard but couldn't find a single stick on the ground. I can't believe we can't find a stick. It's like they've all been picked up, Ed said. Well, we'll just have to look in the woods to find one, Dad said. Graham and Gramps' house had a big backyard with lots of trees. But about 30 yards behind the house, the trees got thicker until it was less of a yard and more of a wilderness. This was one of Ed's favorite things about Graham and Gramps' house. He and his mom and dad and sister lived in a small town south of Atlanta, and there weren't very many places he could run and play in the woods, except for the city park, but that didn't really count. Ed always looked forward to exploring the woods behind Graham and Gramps' house, and before long he was running ahead of his dad, having forgotten all about the stick they were supposed to be looking for. Uh, don't go too far, Ed, Dad called to him. I won't. Hey, come check out the stream, Ed replied. By the time Ed's dad caught up to him, Ed was halfway down a steep bank that led to a stream. 
The water was running quickly over some rocks, and it grew louder as Ed's dad began to climb down the bank. Oh, hold on, Ed. Don't go too far. This dirt looks loose. Uh, you might fall in, Dad said. Uh, don't worry, Dad. I go here all the time. I know what I'm doing. I, I just want to get a little closer so I can get some of the smooth rocks out of the... Whoa! Ed cried out as he slipped. He tried to stop himself from sliding by reaching for a root sticking out of the bank. He grabbed the root, but it gave way, and he fell all the way down into the water. The creek was deeper than it looked, and Ed was all the way underwater before he was able to catch his breath. As he panicked, he sucked in a mouthful of ice-cold water. The whole cold hit him like a thousand knives, but the thing that scared him most was the feeling that he couldn't breathe. Ed was able to get to his feet long enough to get his head out of the water and see that he was being carried downstream before the current took him back under. This time he closed his mouth and before he went under, but his lungs were aching from the lack of oxygen. When Dad saw Ed slip, he had tried to reach him, but before he could get to him, he watched as Ed fell into the creek, immediately realizing that his son was not going to be able to stand up and walk out, but that he was being pulled under and away from him. Ed's dad scrambled back up the bank and began running along the bank, trying to keep Ed in his sight. He saw him pop his head up above the water and could see his face long enough to know that Ed was scared and was having trouble breathing. Hold on, Ed, I'm coming, Dad called, more to assure himself than Ed, since he knew Ed probably couldn't hear him. Looking downstream, he saw a tree that had fallen across the creek. Its branches were hanging down almost to the water and thought that if Ed could reach them, he could hold on till he could get to him. As he raced to the tree, he looked back and saw Ed's face break the surface of the water again. He didn't know if Ed could hear him, but he called out to him anyway. There are branches coming up. Try to grab onto them, he cried. Ed went back under as he continued being pulled downstream faster than before. Dad ran faster, jumping over a stump and dodging a hole in the ground as he tried to keep both Ed and the fallen tree in sight. He could tell that Ed was going to get to the branches a few seconds before he would, and he prayed as he ran. Lord, please let Ed see the branches and grab them. Give him strength to hold on and help me to get to him in time. Just then he heard Ed cry out in pain. Ah! He had slammed into the branches with his side, but he had managed to grab on and was holding as tight as he could. Hold on, Ed, I'm coming, Dad yelled. When Dad got to the fallen tree, he stopped to catch his breath. He noticed that although the tree had a lot of limbs and leaves, the trunk wasn't very big. He knew he would have to be very careful as he climbed out to reach it, or else he would also fall in and they would both be in trouble. I can't hold on much longer, Dad, Ed cried. I'm coming, Dad said. Dad began to climb out onto the fallen tree, placing his feet and hands carefully so as not to fall or shake the tree too much and cause Ed to be knocked loose from the branch. After what seemed like forever, but was probably only 30 seconds, Dad was close enough to Ed to reach down and grab him by the arm. I've got you. Help me pull you up, he said. Ed tried to push up on the limbs around him, but suddenly realized he couldn't move his foot. Uh, my foot stuck, he said. What's it stuck on, Dad asked. I can't tell. It feels like I can move it, but I can't pull it up, Ed replied. Just then, Ed realized why he couldn't free his foot. His shoestring was caught up in some of the tree roots below the water. As the pain of cold hit him again and the ache in his lungs got worse, he began to panic, thinking that he wasn't going to be able to get free. Just then, he remembered his new pocket knife. Dad! Hold me while I get my knife out and cut my shoestring, Ed said. Okay, but be careful, Dad replied. As Dad held him tightly under the arm, Ed pulled his pocket knife out of his right front pocket and brought it to his left hand to open the blade. Once he had it open, he reached down with his left hand and tried to cut his shoestrings. But as he did, he realized that nothing was happening. He didn't understand until he brought the knife back up and looked at it. He touched the edge and found out that it was dull. He began to panic again. It's not sharp enough. I can't cut the string. I'm going to be pulled under, he shouted. Hold on, Ed, Dad said as he tightened his grip on Ed's arm with his left hand and reached back to his pocket with his right. He pulled his pocket knife out and opened it with one hand using a small stud on the blade. 
Here, use this, he said, handing the knife to Ed. Having put his knife back in his pocket, Ed took his dad's knife by the handle and reached down to his shoestring again. This time it only took a little pressure on the string and the knife cut through easily. Suddenly his foot was free and the current caused him to be pulled further under the tree. He held on to his dad, but as he reached to grab the limb, he dropped the knife. I dropped it, he said. Don't worry about it. Just help me pull you up, dad replied. As Ed pushed up on the branches and his dad pulled from above, he was able to free himself from the tangle of the tree and to climb up on top of the trunk. He lay there against his dad for a few minutes, catching his breath. Come on, let's get off this tree before we both fall in, Dad said. Ed and his dad carefully made their way down the trunk till they were safe back on the bank above the stream. Are you okay? Dad asked as he checked Ed for injuries. I think so, but I'm freezing and my side hurts really bad. Dad helped Ed take off his wet jacket and t-shirt. Then he took off his own coat and put it around him. He picked him up and walked back to the house as fast as he could. Once they were inside, Dad sat down with Ed on the floor in front of the fire and called for Ed's mom. She, along with Sarah, Graham, and Grant, came in from the kitchen asking where they had been. Mom was the first to notice that Ed was shivering and his cheeks were blue. What happened? She cried as she hurried over to Ed. He fell in the creek. Thankfully, there was a tree across it, and he was able to hang on to a branch till I could get to him. He hit the branches pretty hard, and he said his side hurts. He may have some bruised ribs, Dad explained. As Ed's mom and dad helped him get out of his wet clothes, Graham and Sarah went to the kitchen to make him some hot chicken noodle soup, while Graham went to run a hot bath. After his bath, Ed sat on the couch in warm, dry pajamas with a blanket over him and his soup on a TV tray. He was breathing okay, so Dad said they would just watch him over the next day or two and decide if he needed to go to the doctor about his ribs. In the meantime, he was going to get plenty of rest over Christmas. That was okay with him. He had had enough adventure for one vacation. As he ate his soup, though, one thing bothered him. Gramp, he said. Yes, Ed, Gramp replied. When my shoestring was caught on that root, I tried to cut it with my knife, but the blade was dull. I had to use Dad's knife. Why did you give me a dull knife, he asked. Well, that was part of what I wanted you to learn. Do you remember the verse I asked you to read, Gramp asked. I think it was Ecclesiastes 10.10, 10, Ed replied. That's right. It says, if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then he must put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. What that means is that if your knife isn't sharp, it isn't much use. In the same way, if you don't live by wisdom, you're going to have a hard time in this life. I gave you a dull knife because I wanted you to see how hard it is to whittle when your knife's not sharp. I knew your dad always carried a sharp knife and that he would help you. Later, I'll show you how to sharpen your knife on a sharpening stone. By the way, I picked up all the sticks from the yard so that you and your dad would have to go into the woods to find one. I thought it would be more fun than just picking one up out of the yard. I certainly didn't think it would lead to such an adventure. I thank God that you are okay. But whatever does help demonstrate, but what happened does help demonstrate the point I was trying to make. The other verse I was going to have you read was Proverbs 9 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Ed, I want you and Sarah to know that the best gift you got was not a mirror or a knife, but the Bible. Sarah learned that the Word of God shows us what we really are and how to make things right. And I hope you have learned that this life is much easier and better if we will live by the wisdom of God's Word, Gramp explained. I wish I had learned that lesson a little sooner, Maybe I would have listened to Dad's wisdom and not climbed down that bank. I know one thing for sure now, though. <laughs> What's that? Gramp asked. I'm going to use a stone to keep my knife sharp, and I'm going to read God's word to keep my life sharp, Ed said. Gramp smiled. Now that's wisdom. Well, I hope you enjoyed that story. Gramp gave Ed and Sarah those gifts because he loves them and because he wanted to teach them the lessons that the Word of God gave them. 
I hope you got those lessons as well. I hope you found some joy and some value from this story and uh, that you found that it truly is a tale worth telling. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do so. Please leave me a comment. Let me know what you thought about the story and uh, be watching because there'll be some new stories coming soon. Until then, God bless.